Hey there, first official video. So I thought it would be a good idea to tackle something simple for starters. Like, you know, complexity. Now, when people say this or the other thing is complicated, they may mean a number of things. And they may even have a number of ways of gauging it, of, you know, putting a number on it. But in the end, there really is no universal way of doing so, and that can be a bit of an inconvenience. Now, I didn't think about this too recently when I saw uh, a MP video on the topic. First off, if you don't know who MP is, what the fuck you waiting for anymore? Go watch his content like now, subscribe, then get back here and we may continue. Now that we've done all that, check out the video in the description, the video in question, which is a collab with Sean Carroll, popular popularizer of science, like you know, Michio Baku and Neil de Tyson and all the other usual suspects. Anyway, the bit that excited my imagination was this diagram, this qualitative diagram over here. Now, let's see what's going on over here. We've got this S curve over here, which represents the entropy of an isolated system. Second law of thermodynamics. The entropy of an isolated system never decreases with time. And that's what we're seeing over here. So, checks. But what about this other thing over here? Carol drew on qualitative arguments and using the example of the coffee getting mixed up with the milk that this is the general behavior of things that in some sense things start out simple you know simple, and then they get complicated they get complex but then eventually they hit a period of decadence where they start getting simple again. And this is the general trend, but we are left with the question of how do we define this thing? Because we can clearly see that this is not the entropy. The entropy must always grow for the... it must never decrease for, a, for an isolated system, but this thing does for this thing not so much uh, I mean we have like it or not a precise definition for entropy then can we find something like that for this complexity thing as well and I was on the process of thinking about what what would be such a definition when I I, I noticed what we make you may call a mathematical coincidence that I've already seen this profile here before. And it turns out that this is just, this happens to be just the average entropy of a coin, of an ordinary coin. The concepts that we are going to need are rather simple and we don't need to get too deep into the theory, but here is a, a little summary of the ideas, the main ideas. If you have a coin and you make a coin toss, you have some chance of getting heads and some chance of getting tails. Let's say that the chance of you getting heads is B. Then that means that the chance that you get tails must be 1 minus B. Why that? Because the sum of the possibilities must add up to certainty. Now, these two quantities over here, they will be really all that we are going to need to define this thing called, which I've called the average entropy of the coin. We, we do this through this function over here, this S bar function. Now, one thing interesting about this function is that if you 
plot this S bar as a function of P in your calculator or whatever, guess what sort of profile you get. Can you guess what it will look like? Here it is. Which is exactly the same profile that we have seen before in the qualitative argument. But what does this mean? The, does this mean anything at all? Well, before we, we go about asking that question, I should really show you uh, a few more uh, things on the theory of entropy. The thing is, if you have a set of n, big n, uh, positive or, or rather non-negative numbers, such that they all add up to unity, whatever they may be, if they satisfy this condition, then we may define the S bar function via this expression over here. Now, keep in mind that this is a general function. We are not concerning ourselves here on the details of where did this came from and why it is defined the way it is. We are just defining a function and we will refer to it, for convenience, as Shannon's function. Specialists in certain areas of knowledge will know why, but this is not important here. Now, bearing in mind Shannon's function is just math, we may transport it, along with its nice properties, to Carroll's qualitative arguments. Let's illustrate this with a very simple example. Say I have a system comprised of two subsystems. Let's call them prime and two prime. The overall system has reached equilibrium, which means its entropy doesn't change with time. But that's not quite true of the subsystems. But they are almost there. So we may tailor expand their entropies as linear functions of time. Under these conditions, we may write, quite generally, expressions such as this, where a, b, and c are some constant numbers, and, but their value, their exact value is not important. Now, let's introduce a new concept. We've seen that each subsystem has its own partial entropy. So, we might define what we may call the fractional entropy of each subsystem simply by dividing that entropy by the total entropy of the system. Now, if we apply this definition to the prime system, we get this formula over here, which we can see is still a linear function of time. We might apply the definition as well for the two prime system. But we notice from this here definition and from the fact that there are only two subsystems that whatever this might be, it will also be identical to one minus x prime. So we don't have to worry about the explicit form of x two prime. In the following, I'm really only going to need these two numbers over here. So what am I going to do? I'm simply going to feed these feed, feed numbers to Shannon's function over here, which I've called C. And I'll end up with this nice little expression over here. That's all fine and dandy, but what I really want is the dependency on time which is over here. But, but then again, this is just a linear function, so there is not much trouble in the choice of this constant over here. 
So I, I may as well, without loss of generality, pick a equals c and b equals zero, so that x prime is exactly equal to the time itself. Meaning that if I plot now this c function as a function of time, I'll get the profile of guess what? The same behavior that we have been seeing uh, many times by now. Should be noticed that it would hardly be an argument to say that what we just did in comparing the qualitative behavior of this complexity thing with this C function the way we've defined it is proof that we've actually found the mathematical expression for the complexity of systems. However, here's one thing that we may do. Let's define a C function as defined over here for any system. And we can always do that. Now, this thing which we may call the channel complexity of the system, we may think of as generalizing in some way the behavior of the system that we have been just studying. And whether or not this is the case, whether or not this actually happens, is besides the point. The point I want to make here is that this thing gives us a start on a universal recipe on how to slap numbers to the complicatedness of things. And since we can now start slapping number to things, numbers to things, we can start having some fun, which was the original idea of this video. Now, I'm not Frank Drake, sorry. Nonetheless, I can conjure up a Drake-esque equation describe the entropy of a galaxy. Here it is. Entropy is n star times s star. Number of typical stars. Entropy of a typical star. What I mean by that is that here I have my galaxy and I'll chop it up in many stars sectors. Like so. And each of these star sectors contain exactly one star. What this means is that I am considering the entropy of the entire star sector to come just from the star. This is naive, but I hope at least somewhat reasonable, because this is just a simplistic description. We will also need some information in the fractional entropies of each star sector. Here it is. All are equal, and all are equal to the inverse of n star. Now, we are ready to go. From this, we can calculate the complexity of the galaxy. Yes, by putting in the formula. Putting this here. And since all are equal, it goes outside the summation. So it all comes to the value of n star. Now, estimates for this n star may vary. This is my galaxy and I'll do whatever I want with it. 
and I'm feeling like having about say 10 to the, to the 18 stars in there so if I swap this over here it gives me the grounds to say whenever someone asks me how complicated can a galaxy be I can show them this example and say with a straight face But you should keep in mind this definition is super general. It allows me to talk about the complexity of, say, the narrative of a book. I know it may sound counterintuitive at first to say that English text has entropy, but it comes simply from the statistics of letter sequences and as such. And this was first worked out comprehensively by this guy Shannon. Anyway, let's pick, say, a book trilogy as our next example. You can calculate the overall entropy of the whole thing as well as the entropy of individual books or chapters or whatever. Feed these numbers into the formula I just gave you and get a number out of that. So I'll leave this as an exercise to you. How complicated do you think the H2G2 can possibly be? You know, come to think of it, I think there's a joke to be made somewhere here. Can't tell what it is. Now, if you happen to know your information theory or statistical mechanics, here's the thing you might be probably thinking by now. But look, Shannon's function, as you call it, maxes out if all the p's are equal. Or in physics parlance, you might want to say, when the system has reached equilibrium. So, are you saying that the most complex systems are necessarily those that, well, above or nothing interesting at all. Well, hold on. Let's put this in a real life context. I have a system. It's comprised of a machine that, you know, does some kind of work, but it's also comprised of batteries which are the things that give the energy for the machine to do the work but whatever I'll pick my system and I'll start using it I'm using away my system to the batteries run our juice okay when that happens the entropy of this thing will be a constant as well as the entropies of the machine and of the batteries that bend the machine. But the point here that they will not be necessarily the same number. Or, in other words, when the system has reached equilibrium, its complexity will not necessarily be the top complexity, the maxed out complexity. So we don't have a borrowing statement that top complexity equals equilibrium or vice versa because that depends crucially in the definition of the system and the subsystems. And here we have an obvious way of defining the subsystems. We have the machine and we have the batteries that feed the machine. Here's another way to visualize what I just said. Suppose that we, our system starts at time ti and it ends or stops at time tf. At those times you can calculate the complexity of the system, say it's this and this. Now, since as we've seen, the complexity does not necessarily is maximal at the, these end points, that means that in general, whatever the detailed behavior of the C function is, 
we might expect that at some point, say, at the time tm, the complexity of the system will be maximal. So this is to say that this will not always be the case, but generally, this is what we may expect. That in most cases, this is what will happen. Tm will not be on the endpoints most of the time. So here we have that pattern, the qualitative behavior, again, as we described at the beginning of the video. With this new bit of information on our minds, we can try and tackle the coffee milk, milk problem to try to understand why this system is simple in the beginning and the end, but it's complex during the mixing of, of the things. Let's first think in terms of a system that is comprised of two subsystems, the bottom and the top of, say, your chicken. And for simplicity, consider that they have the same problem. I want you to try and figure what the complexity of the final homogeneous mixture would be in this case. And ignore the small volume adjustment that there's gonna be, ignore that. Great. Now, let's think of the system in another way, another, uh, a, a more chemical way, so to say. Let's think of our subsistence as the neighborhood of each individual molecule of the coffee and the milk. So now we have way more than two subsystems. We have of the order of say 10 to the 24 subsystems. Try to do the same, figure out the complexity of the final homogeneous mixture. mixture. Bear in mind that for these subsystems, we will never attain a static equilibrium uh, because the molecules, you know, they never sit still. They are always going around, going around everywhere randomly. And they also bounce around each other. So they never sit still. So we don't speak here of a static equilibrium like we could speak here in this case or in this case. Instead, we talk of a dynamical equilibrium. But regardless of that, I want you to think about this and, and, and you gotta use a little chemical thinking as well. Think of uh, the neighborhoods. What molecules will be neighbor to what molecules? Like we have milk molecules here, we have coffee molecules over here during the mixing process. And think about how all the things pack inside your chica. So, making all those considerations, try to picture what the final complexity of the systems will be. Of the, the system will be. Will it be uh, the maximal complexity or will it be smaller than the complexity of the system during some previous time, during the mixing up process? Try to think about this, about this. But bear in mind, you don't need a detailed molecular theory of th those things to understand this. It's just a qualitative behavior. All right, so this has been a rather long video, but it's more or less the way I think I'll, I'll do things here. So I'll, I'll try to make them as short as possible, but I can make promises. And anyway, the point of this are you you go through these videos at your own leisure. Try to ruminate on the ideas. Try to see if they make sense. And if they don't make sense, you can always go to the comment section and let me know no. why not. So this wraps this video. This wraps things for this video. And I'm I'm trying, I, I expect the next video to be on a topic that tends to be lots of fun. The multiverse of quantum mechanics. I'll see you then, and till then, bye and peace.